sing. But stand, if you would, please, and join us as we sing. You move the mountains and you split the sea. You call the dead man up to live and breathe. The same authority's alive in me. So I'll move the mountains and I'll split the sea. I speak to the lies, truth in the name of Jesus. I speak to the fear, hope in the name of Jesus. I speak to the brokenness, wholeness in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. When I'm surrounded and I cannot stand, when insecurities are creeping in, I won't bow down to any fear of man, cause he who is within me is the great I am. I speak to the lies, truth in the name of Jesus. I speak to the fear, hope in the name of Jesus. I speak to the brokenness, wholeness in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Something happens when we sing your praises. Something happens and the whole room changes. It's the power of your name. Oh, the name of Jesus. Something happens when we sing your praises. Something happens and the whole room changes. It's the power of your name. Oh, the name of Jesus. I speak to the lies, truth in the name of Jesus. I speak to the fear, hope in the name of Jesus. I speak to the brokenness, wholeness in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let's pray together. Joel, we thank you so much that we could be here today. We thank you that we could come together and we thank you that we can worship in your name. I pray that you would be in our midst today and that everything we say and do would be focused on you and worshiping you and you alone. It's your name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. I do want to welcome you here today and say thanks for being here. If you're visiting with us for the first or second time, if you have not yet had an opportunity to fill out a Connect With Us card, you'll find those in that basket in your row of chairs. If you'll fill that Connect With Us card out and bring it by the kitchen afterwards, we have a gift as our way of saying thanks for being here. If you're a regular here and you have tithes or offerings that you'd like to give, also in that basket you'll find offering envelopes and a way that you can scan to give if you'd prefer to give online. So we want to thank you for taking the time to do that. Uh, I will have some announcements for you in just a moment, but first Larry Ash is going to come with a presentation for the church. Thank you. Good morning. thought you were really going to be quiet at first. Uh, most of you know that I'm big, heavily involved, I guess is a better word, with the uh, uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship and the Good News Clubs. This church is sponsoring a Good News Club at Rome School. You've been doing it for uh, a year, I guess now. Uh, so on behalf of Child Evangelism Fellowship, I have a plaque here that says, thank you for your faithful service in taking the good news of Jesus Christ to the children at Rome School. So thank you very much for doing that. Larry told me, and he, I think he forgot part of what he was going to do, and that was that he was going to put a plug in. I was going to do that. That if you want to help with the Rome grade school, good news club. Thanks for reminding me of what I'm supposed to say. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, this is my daily life. <laughs> if it's not on my calendar, I don't know that I'm supposed to do it. But at any rate, uh, we do only have three people working there. They're really faithful, and I'm thankful for them. We're supposed to have a minimum of four. 
and five or six would be better. So if the Holy Spirit has touched your heart that maybe you should be doing something else, then you could talk to me or Robin Keel, either one, about helping out there. There's training available for that and training's required. Uh, September 20 and 21. So, thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. you and if you want to be involved, there's, there are opportunities. We have a group that goes to Rome, but some from our church have helped at the Summersville Good News Club, and some from our church have helped at the Kell uh, Good News Club. And so there's more opportunities. And so if, you, if that day of the week that, that Rome happens doesn't work for you, if you want to just get trained and say, hey, I'll go and help in another club, you can absolutely do that. So if you want to know more about the training, talk to Larry, and uh, he can get you the information about the September training and where it's at and all of that kind of stuff. So it's a it's a great organization and we're proud to be a part of it. Um, I do thank you so much for being here today. I do want to let you know we have um, some, some special things going on upcoming. This Wednesday night, we do have Bible study on Wednesday night and there is youth this Wednesday night. And so uh, we would invite you to come to that. And we'll have, uh, we have Vacation Bible School coming up just around the corner. If you'd like to volunteer for that, you can talk to Stephanie Alvis. We'll be talking more about that in the coming weeks. So we do thank you for being here today. Let's pray as we get get started. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for today. I pray that you would be in our midst and that you be honored by our service, Lord. I pray that today we would be focused on you and that um, we won't be distracted by all of the other stuff that's going on. In your name we pray. Amen. Say it again if you would, please. Who tells the sun to rise every morning, colors the sky with the shades of his glory, wakes us with mercy and love, Jesus does. Who holds the orphan, comforts the widow, cries for injustice, feels every sorrow, Carries the pain of his children, Jesus does. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, he saved me from who I was. That's what Jesus does. Stands the heart of a sinner, showers his grace over all our mistakes, washes us clean with his blood. Jesus does. Who sings a song of sweet forgiveness? Who stole the keys to hell and the grave? Who has the power to save? Jesus does. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. That's what Jesus Jesus does. Oh, what a friend. Oh, what a Savior. He's always been good. He's always been faithful. He came to my rescue when I needed him most and saved my soul. So we sing praise to the Father gave us the Son, praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son, praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, 
He saved me from who I was. That's what Jesus does. Do you feel the word? is broken we do do you feel the shadows deepen we do but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all Is he worthy? Is he worthy? 
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. So every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your
we can speak your name over all these things. And we know in the end who wins. God, I pray if there's anyone here today that doesn't understand the power of your name, the blessings you want to give, the life you want to give, the eternal life you want to give, Lord, I pray that today is the day that they seek you, that they come and find you to know the overwhelming love and power of your son, Jesus. It is in his name that I pray. Amen. Good morning. We have been working our way through the book of Ezra, but we're going to step away from Ezra just a little bit today. We're going to take a, a few weeks off from Ezra. We were, we were kind of a stopping point, if you've been following with us in Ezra. That first group of returnees uh, to the promised land have returned. The temple's built. Things are going good. So we're going to give them just a minute to rest on that. Um, and we're going to go in a different direction today. Um, what I want to talk about today is something that, that ministers talk about, and I don't know if you here talk about it, but um, we talk about it in church circles, and it's something that we call the summer slump. And what the summer slump is, is the next few months that we're about to enter into. Now, you may be looking at your schedule and thinking, my schedule is anything but a slump. And I understand that. But what we talk about in churches is that as we move into the months of June and July and August, Lower attendance is something that we see for these few months. We see lower attendance because of any number of different things. And then because of the lower attendance, we see lower giving. People are busy doing so many different things. Family reunions, baseball games, graduations, camp, you name it. And I understand there are reasons that each of us are going to be pulled into different directions and have to go different places and do lots of different things. But... Instead of allowing our church to, to fall into the statistic of what we call the summer slump, what if we took this time as an opportunity to prepare ourselves for what God is doing? What if we took this time to say, we're going to spend the next few months praying about and asking what would God have us do next? How can I begin to spiritually prepare myself for what God is already doing? And as I began praying about, about the sermon this week, I felt like God wanted me to talk about this. And God was saying that we as a church don't have to fall into that statistic. And that we need to talk about how we can be involved with God's plan for our church. We're going to look at a passage from Ephesians, and it begins in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read verse 7, which says, Now grace was given to each, of, each one of us, according to the measure of Christ's gift. The letter to the Ephesians was written to the church at Ephesus. Now, there are some assumptions made when a letter is written to a church. And one of those assumptions that is made is that this is a body made up of believers. That that is a prerequisite and something that all of these believers hold in common is that they are all, they all have a faith in Jesus Christ. Now we as Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, we have this as a prerequisite to be a member of the church. You proclaim and you profess that you are a common faith. And that's what makes us a church and that's what makes us a part of the church. Because we've all received the free gift of salvation offered by Christ, we've all been shown grace, and we know what grace is. And grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Christ showed us all grace. Grace is unmerited favor, something we do not and cannot and will never deserve. And on top of that, he gives us spiritual giftings. And that's where we're going to put, pick up and look a little bit more in depth. Because this reference is down into verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 4 where it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And what this is saying is that Christ has gifted all of us differently and in complementary ways. And you may look at this list and you may think, you know what? None of those apply to me. I don't see anywhere in those lists where anything applies to me. 
And you don't have to find yourself in anywhere in this list because this is a very specific listing of gifts right here. It's a very specific list of, of gifts that God has given. The apostles were those that walked with Christ and the prophets were those that came before him and that proclaimed his coming. They laid a foundation that we build upon today with our evangelists and our pastors and our teachers. And all of these are very up. But scripture goes on with very specific instructions that these gifts are given for a specific purpose. To equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. These gifts are given to equip the saints. That's all of us who attend, who are a part of a church. The, the gifts are given to equip the saints for the work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. That's the calling of pastors and teachers and evangelists, to equip the saints. I often use a word, and it kind of has a negative, a negative connotation in our society today. But there's a word called an enabler. And people will say, oh, you're such an enabler, and it's a bad thing, right? You're enabling someone to do something they shouldn't be doing. You're an enabler. But as a pastor, I feel like part of my calling is to be an enabler for good. And that I give you all of the tools or place you in a situation and give you the teaching and tools that you need to fulfill the call that Christ has placed upon your life. Put everything in your hands to help you as the church to prepare for the work of ministry. And here is where many people have a problem with these specific giftings, with the giftings of the, the pastor, the evangelist, the teacher. Because they don't really want to be equipped for ministry. I'd rather not have the tools given to me. Because I would rather just somebody else do all the work. Right? That's why you hire a preacher, so that they can do all the work. Right? That's your job. To take care of everything. But according to this scripture right here, the job of the pastor is to equip the saints and to build the body up for the work of ministry. Now, there is a double-edged sword to that, and that I'm also a part of the church, and I'm also called to that ministry, right? And so I have to be built up and encouraged as well. We all need to be built up. We all need to be encouraged to be equipped for the work of ministry. And in churches, we tend to fall into two camps. One, where we see and we say that we expect the preacher to just do everything. Or we fall into another camp where we say, oh, the preacher doesn't do nothing. All he does is get up there and preach on Sunday morning. I hear that all the time, right? You only work on Sundays, right? Wouldn't that be great? When in reality, the teaching ministry is important because it's equipping us for ministry. And I hope you see that when you come to church, that the teaching ministry of whoever's teaching your Sunday school class or the teaching ministry of whatever small group you're in, or when we're sitting here learning together, that this is a part of equipping us to do the ministry and to build up the body of Christ. These teaching ministries have a purpose. It's not just something that's on our calendar that we check off that we came and we did. But we should be being equipped to do ministry. And here's the thing. I'm going to let you behind the veil this morning and tell you something that people may not be willing to tell you very often. And that is that the preaching and teaching ministry is hard. It is hard when you sit down and you study and you prepare and you seek the Lord and you seek out and you study a scripture and you go top to bottom and you study it inside and out and you get up here and you deliver a sermon and you tell the people exactly what God has led you to, what God has taught you this week. You're excited about it, you share about it, and then somebody shakes your hand at the back door and says, I disagree. Because I don't like that because it makes me uncomfortable or because I just don't think that I want to believe that. 
that's hard. One time I stood here and I had studied and I had preached and I, was, I felt like my message was really good and this is what God wanted to say. And while I was preaching, I received a text message. I, I don't wear my watch because my watch would beep and it would tell me that I had a text message and then all I would be able to think about is that I have a message. So I don't even wear my watch. But I went and I picked up my phone. And while I had been preaching somebody accidentally sent me a text message. It was intended for a friend of theirs that was talking about me and about who did I think I was to tell people that they should come to church. And who did I think I was to browbeat the congregation in that way? And I, I never, I never want to be somebody that you feel is browbeating you. So do not hear that as we preach today and as we share today. That is not what I desire to do. But what I desire to do is to equip you for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. And that's what I desire to do. So I'm letting you behind the veil, not so that you say, oh, poor Jason, like, oh man, people are, people are really rude. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is many times people look at the pastor and they say, pastor, why don't you make things better in the church? I am here to equip you for the work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ and together, together, it's a two-way street, we can do that. We should share the common goal of building up the body of Christ. Is that our common goal? Is our common goal that we will build up the body of Christ? Because when we have a common goal, we have unity. This unity comes when we don't share a common goal for whatever the reason. The building up and the desire to have the building up of the body of Christ leads to unity. And that's what verse 13 says. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. Growing into maturity with a stature measured by God, by Christ's faithfulness. And as I read this, I'm going to say something that somebody's going to shake my hands at the back door and say they don't agree with. Okay? But if you follow me and read this scripture... This is going to be a little hard to grasp, but stick with me. Unity isn't the goal. Unity is not our goal. So many times over my 20 plus years in ministry, I have heard unity preached as the ultimate goal of the church. That we need to do everything that we can to have unity as if that is our ultimate goal. But I don't think that's true. Unity should not be our goal. Unity should be a byproduct of sharing the same goal. And that goal should be maturity in Christ. And if we are all pursuing maturity in Christ, if we are all fervently and and as strongly as we can pursuing maturity measured by the stature of Christ and the fullness of Christ, then we will have unity as a byproduct. It can't be our goal. It's a byproduct of sharing the same goal of maturity in Christ. And if we're all sharing that, we will have unity in Christ. And instead, we've somehow made unity the goal. And then when we think that we agree with everybody and we get a group of people and we all agree about something and the people that are next to us look just like us and act just like us, then we're all unified and we're doing what God wants us to do. When in reality, if that's how we measure our goal, then the people agreeing with us next to us that look like us and act like us has nothing to do with Christ. And instead what we're finding is that we're not growing. Why are we not growing? Because we've made our goal the wrong thing. We got there. We arrived. We all agree. Good job. Good job. And that's why we hit a summer slump. Because we arrived. Good for us. The problem is 
we left Christ out of the equation. And none of us pursued maturity in Christ. When we reach maturity in Christ or when we begin to pursue maturity in Christ, Ephesians 14, 4, 14 says, then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. Are you influenced by what other people say and do? I'm going to be honest. I am. I always have been. I've always been influenced by what other people say. I was the kid that if the teacher said good job, I, that's what I was looking for. As I grew up, I, I, was not, I was not good at anything that involved a ball. Base, no. Basket, no. Volley, no. Anything, a ball in it, I was not good at it. I was good at talking. I know. And so I began to compete in giving speeches. And every week I would get pieces of paper in which people would tell me if I did good or bad. And I would adjust how I was doing based upon what people wrote. And it made me very influenced by what other people said. And you know, sometimes still today, if we're like in a line at a fast food restaurant, I need to order first. Because if I hear what you're ordering, I might get it because it sounds really good. And I say that joking, but I think we're all influenced by what other people say. Nobody wants someone to say something negative about them. But when it comes to spiritual matters, we can't be influenced by what other people say. We can't be tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching. And let me tell you, there are some windy teachers out there. There are some teachers out there, and when you hear it, it's going to sound good. There are spiritual teachers out there that when they preach or when they teach, it sounds very good, but it does not measure to the stature of the fullness of Christ. And here's where we have a problem, a problem in many of our churches, and why we're falling for what Scripture calls the cleverness in the techniques of deceit. And that's because we lack biblical literacy, knowledge of the Word of God. We lack that. We don't know, and so when something sounds good, then we believe it because it sounds good, not because it measures to the Word of God. That's why it's so important that we are involved in discipleship. You all have taken the first step. You have come to church, and that is wonderful, and I am glad that each and every one of you are here. But understand, please, that that is simply the first step. Going beyond that, it's important that each and every one of us is involved in some kind of discipleship. A small group in which you're learning from these teachers who are equipping you for the work of ministry. It's vitally important that you find some form of discipleship, some form of learning to be involved in. I want to personally invite you, each and every one of you, to choose a Sunday school class. That's the next step. Choose a Sunday school class and become involved in it. And I'm going to speak for the other teachers here. Come and try a class out, and if it's not for you, go to another one. And teachers, don't get your feelings hurt when they try another one, because it's more important that people try multiple classes until they find the class that they can attend than that your feelings don't get hurt. It's more important that we have people in classes and here each Sunday. We can't get our feelings hurt, because you know what? We're not competing against each other. I'm not going to give somebody a button at the end of the year and say, congratulations, you had the biggest class this year. We don't do that. Some churches do. I know. We used to have this thing that went around when I was, when I was growing up. It was this little banner, and it hung on your, if you have perfect attendance for the whole month, this banner hung on your door. We're not going to do that. Because you know what's more important than a banner? I'll give you all a banner. Okay. It's more important that we're in discipleship. And if you're attending Sunday school regularly and you're enjoying your Sunday school class, I am glad for you. But let's take the next step and get involved in another level of discipleship. On Sunday night, we offer discipleship classes. 
that we're taking the summer off right now to give our workers a break. You know why we're doing that? Because our workers in the children's ministry have been up there so long that we want them to still love children. Right? I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But come and get involved on a Sunday night discipleship class. And then after that, come on Wednesday night. Find another discipleship class. This Tuesday night, Jennifer is starting a women's discipleship class at her house. Men's ministry on the 20th of this, of this month is men's ministry. And men's ministry is also going to be starting a small group. There are plenty of opportunities for discipleship. Will you choose to grow in God's word? You know, I was in youth ministry for a long time. And people, they like to criticize when there's not something offered for them. I had this young man, and he had just graduated from high school. And this was before we had our Sunday night discipleship. We, had, we were having regular services on Sunday night and things like that. He came to me and he said, you know what? I really wish there was a class for, for college kids on Sunday night. And I said, you know what? We have a Sunday school class for college kids on Sunday morning. And that Sunday school class was really struggling. They were really struggling and they didn't have enough people and, and they were really having a hard time. And so I said, you know what, you could come to that Sunday school class. And he said, ugh, it's so early. I really would like it if it was on Sunday night or on Wednesday night and then I could just come when I want to. And how many of us have the same attitude? I just want to come when it's convenient for me and easy for me for someone to spoon feed me. When are we going to move from the milk to the meat? When are we going to say, I will do this and it's inconvenient for me? But I'll do it because my desire above everything else is that I would learn and grow in the Lord. Let's say for the sake of argument, you are attending all the discipleship that's being offered. You're attending all of the options, every opportunity you're given. Keep in mind, I'm here for most of them, so I know that's not very many of you. But let's say for the sake of argument, you're going to all of it. Maybe it's time for you to start teaching something. Maybe it's time for you to step up and take over a teaching role. Can you do that? The children's, the children's teachers in, in uh, Sunday school time have, in the last couple of years, they've started teaching Answers in Genesis Sunday school. And I think they will tell you, if you think that you have learned everything you need to learn, come teach children Sunday school. Because I've heard from multiple teachers that teaching this, I have had to study and I have learned more than I've learned in a long time. And so if you are really eager to learn, then step up and take that over. But speaking of teachers, let's talk about teachers for just a minute. Because I'm one of them. And this scripture speaks directly to me. And if we look at our scripture, we have responsibilities. And now, we, there's also a scripture, and we're going to look at it, James 3, 1. It says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. But don't let that scare you away. Don't let that scare you away, because here's the thing. I'm going to go back to Ezra, where we talked about last week. Okay? If we're speaking the truth, if we're studying God's word, and we're teaching what God's word says, we don't have a judgment to be afraid of. If we are living the way that God wants us to live, we don't have to fear that judgment. So you do what you're supposed to do. But according to our key scripture today, right here we see that teachers have a responsibility to equip the saints for ministry, to grow them in maturity, so that they will not be thrown around by the teachings of this world. And I think this is a standard that we hold very good for pastors, for evangelists, but not necessarily for teachers. But teachers, every single one of us has a responsibility to our students. If you're teaching a Sunday school class, if you're teaching a children's Sunday school class, a youth Sunday school class, an adult Sunday school class, we have a responsibility to our students to teach them, to grow them, so that they will not be thrown around by the teachings of this world. And too often, here's a statement I hear from my Sunday school teachers, from teachers in general. I don't really want to do it, but it's what the class wants. 
Okay. I hear you. But what is your desire? Is your desire to equip the saints for ministry and growth and maturity or to keep people happy? Because being a pastor, an evangelist, a teacher is a lot like being a parent. And parents, what would happen if you gave your children everything they wanted? You'd have a lot of dental bills. And you'd have some bratty kids. Right? Our job as parents is not to give our children everything that they want, but to give them everything that they need. And that, unfortunately, is much harder. I have, with my kids, I've had many conversations in which I will say to them, I know you don't want to have this conversation. But we are going to have a hard conversation right now because your mother and I desire that you grow to be a God-honoring young man. That is our desire. And so because of that, we're going to have a hard conversation. Because of that, there's going to be a punishment. Because of that, X, Y, Z. We're going to give you what you need, not just what you want. But as teachers and as pastors and evangelists, our job is to do the same thing. Not always give everyone everything that they want, but to give them everything that they need. I have this desire for our church. I have spent 19 years of my life at this church. What do I desire for this church? I desire spiritual maturity based on the fullness of Christ. That when the world throws all of the garbage teaching at us, and let me tell you, the world has a lot of garbage teaching right now, that we can take what the world says and that we can measure it in the stature and fullness of Christ and say that is true or that is not true. And that we know as a church that we know the truth when we see it and we know a lie when we see it. That's why I do everything that I, that I can do to fulfill verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. Speaking the truth in love. This is so important for teachers and preachers and evangelists that we speak the truth in love. But here's the lie that the world is feeding us. That we're being told that to speak the truth is unloving. When in reality, not speaking the truth is the most unloving thing we can do. I share with you from a place of love because I desire that the, what the Lord desires, and that is that you grow in every way from him which is the head, Christ. Do we all desire to grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ? Do you see how if we're speaking the truth in love and we're seeking to grow in Christ, that leads to the product of unity. And when this happens, the, the body begins to work together as a body. Even the smallest ligament supports the growth of the whole body. We know about ligaments, don't we? Because many of us have reached the point in our life where if you decide you're gonna take a nap on the couch, you know which ligaments get out of line, right? You didn't know that this ligament right back here was important until it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. Right? I don't even know if there's a ligament back there. But the point I'm making is there are lots of small parts in our body that we may consider in, insignificant until they're not doing 
what they're supposed to do. Many of you have gone through different surgeries, back surgeries, where you say, my C4 is, is four centimeters too far. This, it doesn't sound like much, right? But when it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing, it hurts, and the whole body hurts. We're a body of believers. And you may feel like, I'm just, I'm just me. I'm just one small, insignificant little part. But when any one part of the body isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing, we all hurt. But when we're all working in unity, seeking Christ who is the head, and our whole body is working together, that's what God intends for a church. That's what God intends for this body, for this family, that we'll all be working together with the common goal, with the same goal and the same purpose. Each of us needs each other to grow. And we need the unity that comes from maturity. And that is how we grow together. Do we desire to grow together? Or we desire, do we desire our own agenda? Are we growing toward the common goal of maturity in Christ? If we are seeking to grow in the common goal and the maturity of Christ, we don't have to worry about a summer slump. Because when we grow in Christ, we're going to be so excited about it. We're going to tell other people. I was so excited last week when I had studied Ezra and I had seen this, this stuff from the temple and they were going to have to buy the oil and all this kind of stuff. I couldn't help but tell my Wednesday night group. I told them I'm going to spoil the sermon. But Babylon has to buy the oil. I was so excited. No one else was excited. I was. But when you're studying God's word and when you're, you're growing in maturity and when you're seeking him, you get excited about it. And when you go to lunch, you say, you know what? I'm going to tell this waitress about, about my God that I love. I am so excited. We have some newlyweds here. If you see Dylan and Elena, Dylan's going to introduce you to his wife. He's going to be excited about it. Elena might be. No, Elena's going to be excited to introduce her husband. When you're, when you're a newlywed, you're excited, right? When we're new believers, we're excited. We want to tell people. That excitement doesn't ever have to go away. I'll tell you, I am always excited to introduce my wife. Say, this is my wife. I love her. You're going to love her too. If we love the Lord, and if we're seeking to grow in maturity in him, we're going to say, I love him. You're going to love him too. We get so focused on the wrong things instead of being focused on growing in maturity in Christ. Can we spend this summer focused on growing in maturity in Christ? That we're going to say, you know what, I'm going to spend this next little bit of time and I'm going to pray about what God wants me to do. And I am really going to ask the Lord what he wants me to do. But then, the next step of that is that you do what he asks you to do. Let me tell you, I told you, those people have been up in Awana for a long time. The people that are working in Awana have been in Awana for a long time. That means that a lot of people have gotten to come to Bible study for a long time. For nine weeks, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to teach kids. For nine weeks, I'm going to let somebody who's been teaching kids for three years, I'm going to give them nine weeks to come and sit in Bible study. You know what? I haven't been coming on Sunday nights, but I'm going to start coming on Sunday nights because I'm not in discipleship and I need to be. You know what? I know that it means getting up an hour earlier, but I'm going to come to Sunday school on Sunday morning. I'm going to find a class, and I'm going to keep going until I find my class. I know it's not easy, but the right things rarely are. So join with me in prayer today that we grow in maturity in Christ, measured by the fullness of him. Stand if you would.
Lord, so often we measure maturity by the people sitting around us. But Lord, I pray that our maturity would be measured by you. That we would grow in you. That we would keep our eyes on you. That we set aside our our personal wants, our personal desires. And that we seek you, Lord. that our eyes would be fixed on you and you alone and that we would follow you that we would be obedient to you and that we would do whatever it is you ask of us as we keep our eyes fixed on you We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh Spirit come make us humble, we turn our eyes from evil things, oh Lord we cast down our idols, so give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Yeah.